welcome to the show. Real quick, if you are watching this on YouTube, if you could do me a favor and hit that like button on the video and also subscribe to my channel, that will help me keep going so that I can continue to make content and have great guests like the one today. Uh, I really enjoyed my chat uh, with Jeff Belanger. He is a paranormal investigator and researcher for the show Ghost Adventures, uh, but has also written like 18 books and I read two of them. So I'll definitely have to have him back on the show. Uh, but he's been featured on some paranormal shows and documentaries. Uh, and my favorites were the Shock Doc ones on Discovery+. Plus. So we're going to talk about all those. Uh, his book, The Most Haunted Places. And uh, we'll also talk about some of the most famous paranormal cases ever, including the Devil Made Me Do It case, the exorcism of Roland Doe, which the movie The Exorcist was based on, the Amityville Horror, the Japan Suicide Forest, the Catacombs in Paris, and so much more. So buckle up. Get ready for a fun ride. Make sure to keep the lights on because it's going to get scary. Oh, and uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, I think Jeff's video may freeze a little bit at times, but I don't think it's a ghost. It's probably just a slow internet connection or Zoom is screwing up. So the audio seems to be fine. So either way, you'll enjoy the stories and try not to get too scared. Welcome, Jeff Belanger to the Chuck Shoot Podcast. How are you doing today? Chuck, I'm sitting on a rainbow. How about you? Sitting on a rainbow. I like that one. That's a new one. I haven't heard that before. I like it. So I've got this pet peeve and we're starting off on a bad note. It's oh, shit. Horrible. Okay. So, you know, the, like when it's, so I'm a hiker. I like to hike and, but also me too. Yeah. When you're, you're passing someone and, and the greeting of, Hey, how you doing? It, it irks me so much. Cause I'm like, well, stop. Then let me tell you stranger how hmm. I'm doing. Mom's got the gout and uh, you know, I've got this rash on my leg. That's very itchy. Like you don't really want to know. I, I much prefer the greeting, like "Hey, good day," or like, you know. Well, we whatever. got an hour, so I actually do want to know. I, I, you okay. could tell me anything if you're about I'm, the I'm gout. Doing okay. And, okay. I'm, I'm honestly doing okay. Today's a good day. It's, that's it's, good. Uh, busy, but a good busy. That's good. Yeah, that's busy's good. So yeah, well, let's just dive right in. Uh, I mean, we got. I've read. Uh, I've got two of your books here that I got to read. I guess you have like six. I thought I got them all, but I read this I one have, uh, and this one. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. No, I've got uh, 16 if you're counting. 16? But oh, man. I, I think I saw like eight on Amazon. So are those all on Amazon? Well, yeah. Just I think just about all of them are on Amazon. Yeah. Okay. Well, so just, uh, you know, we, don't, we, can't, we don't, can't tell your whole life story, but just to go into your background a little bit, uh, you believed in ghosts since age 10. And I do. Uh, tell us about growing up next to Ed and Lorraine Warren, the most famous demonologists. They were local celebrities. You got to go inside their museum. Did you get to see the yeah. doll and everything? I saw the doll and everything. I know Annabelle personally, uh, up close and personal. So yeah, I um I grew up in an old New England town, and where I lived, you know, ghost stories were sort of matter of fact. They weren't like you know, just like oh yeah, that house is haunted. That one isn't. You know, it's two hundred fifty years old. What do you expect? Hmm. And uh, I grew up in in Sandy Hook, Connecticut, and the next town over was Monroe, still is Monroe. And that's where Ed and Lorraine Warren lived. And we would see, you know, we'd see them in the grocery store. And uh, Lorraine went to our church sometimes. And, um, you know, they were they were who you went to see in October. You know, if you could get into New York City, you saw the Rockettes at Christmas. And in October, you saw Ed and Lorraine Warren. So from a young age, I was attending their programs. Um, they had a museum at their house. And once I started getting older and I started becoming a writer, you know, they were who you went to for your Halloween feature. So I've kind of known them since I was like 14 hmm. and, um, you know, been to their house, been to the museum, interviewed them, um, you know, seen their programs and, and got to meet Annabelle the doll long before, uh, she was on the big screen. I, I was, she was in the basement of their house. And yeah. So did they kind of mentor you or what do you mean programs? I'm not familiar with the, yeah. So like, uh, like lectures, they okay. would go to local libraries and they'd rent out uh, suites at, at hotels, like conference rooms, mm. and you'd pay 10 bucks to go see them in October. And they would, they would do their programs where like, they would, they would show you some of the evidence they've collected. They'd mm. play audio clips, they'd show video, they'd show still photographs and talk about their work. Mm. So it's interesting. I just watched, I'm, I tried to watch a much, uh, as much of your stuff as I could too. And I watched the exorcist one that you're in the shock doc, which I want to talk about more about that, but it was weird. I just had this thought. I went to take a shower and I was thinking when I was a kid at Bible camp, my, my parents sent me to Bible camp and I had this camp counselor and he had this book on Satanism. And I was like really interested in the book on Satanism. I was like, they, we took a break and I, I went over and I was like thumbing through the book and I kind of got in trouble for it. They're like, you, you need to be reading the Bible, not the Satan book. This was, 
But why, so what do you think it is about why are we so fascinated by evil and all the scary stuff? Like, shouldn't we be trying to avoid that? Are you and I just messed up? What is it so fascinating about it? Well, I mean, uh, the devil's a more interesting character. Just is. Um, yeah. I took this Bible as liter- literature course. And the devil, I mean, depending which which testament you're reading, right? The Old Testament, Satan is just simply the opposer, the, the loyal opposition. And um, he, he gets a little more horned and evil, you know, in the uh, in the New Testament and, and in other books. But um, I, 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 I like to look at that kind of stuff through the lens of really all beliefs. And I think like the, the, the idea of yin and yang has it so well, right? So mm-hmm. you've got, you know, you've got this, these, these two forces that are always in contention with each other. And yet, if you took one of them away... Uh, we would have no point of reference. So could one exist without the other? Could you have God without the devil? Could you have good without evil? Could you have evil without good? Um, we need If, if we live in a, a world of free will, then we need to be able to make that choice. And if one of the choices is taken away, you don't have free will and whatever. We're all good and it doesn't matter what we do and or we're all bad and it doesn't matter what we do. So I, 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 I feel like the concept is, it's run, it gets to a much deeper conversation but uh, but there is always this allure of evil, right? The, the allure mm-hmm. is like, it's the quick path to something, mm-hmm. you know, um, but it comes at a price, you know, it comes at a, at a price. It could be your immortal soul. It could be your freedom, right? If you, if you do something bad and you go to jail, um, you know, yeah, you can yeah. try to steal a bunch of money and get rich that way, which is way easier than like working hard and stuff. <laughs> but, but at the same time, there's a consequence for that. And so, uh, within all of us, we always have these these two forces kind of always struggling with each other. Yeah, and I find the I actually find the good stuff interesting too. Like I don't know if you if you know the band Grand Funk Railroad, uh, oh, yeah. but yes, yeah, so I had Mark American Farner. Band. Yeah, I had Mark Farner, the singer uh, guitarist, on my show, and he was telling the story. And again, I, I take all I take all this stuff with a grain of salt. But he told the story about how they were in a car and they were about to hit a tree, and he just got you know he got under the car and uh, or got on the bench of the front seat and prayed. And he says that the car he thinks it went through the tree. He said he looked at the tire tracks and and the cop couldn't figure it out. And I mean, so that's almost just as fascinating, especially if you ever hear him tell that story, you're kind of on the edge of your seat and your jaws drop. You're just like, what? Like, this is real. So it's like, you kind of have to believe in both, right? If you're going to believe in one or the other. Oh, absolutely. And I, you know, I, I've, there's such incredible good in the world. I know if you watch mm-hmm. like the media and stuff, you, you hear the bad stories because right. to quote an old newspaper man, right? If it bleeds, it leads. Um, that fascinates us. You just yeah. asked, why are we so fascinated with the devil? Why are we so fascinated with violence and murder as opposed to the story of like, you know, the kid that helped the granny across the street, mm-hmm. you know, that's just not going to be on your evening news. Um, but at the same time, there's such, there's such good out there, you mm-hmm. know, especially when there's disaster, right? So these horrible things happen yeah. to people and you hear these like little individual stories of heroism and stuff. And I, I love that. I love that mm-hmm. we make those choices too. Um, and, uh, I mean, I don't know, I know for myself to to quote Abraham Lincoln, you know, he said, when I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That's my religion. That makes the most sense to me out of everything. Yeah. No, the amen. That's, that's perfect. Well, let's dive into the, uh, the first book, the, the haunted places. Cause I read that and there's so, we can't go through everyone, but people need to buy the book. But, uh, one that I definitely want to highlight is the catacomb museum, and that, that is just such a fascinating place to me. It's these graveyards in France that, I guess the graveyards got too full, so they just moved these bodies into these underground tunnels, and there's just bones and skulls, and they're stacked in these patterns. And you saw your first uh, ghost there, or something, you think, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. So th- the thing was, I had been writing about ghosts and haunted places for years, mm-hmm before I'd had my own experience. I mean, I grew up and I had friends that said they lived in haunted houses and I believe them. I mean, I didn't see it for myself, but I didn't think they were lying to me. I had weird feelings and stuff like that, but not like, whoa, I think that's an apparition. And so it was 2003 and I was in Paris and I had an afternoon to myself and I, uh, I knew I wanted to go down into the catacombs. And so Paris is this amazing place. It goes back like 2000 years to when it was a Roman outpost. That was the earliest roots of Paris. And then it grew, uh, as towns will do. And when it grew into a city, when you build a city, you put the cemetery on the outskirts, which they did. Sure. But over time, like the, it just kept sprawling, mm-hmm. and the outskirts weren't the outskirts anymore. And the cemeteries became encircled, and uh, and over time, they filled up. 
you know, you can only put so many bodies in there. So it's like the mid 1700s into the 1800s. And they have two big problems. Uh, one, the cemeteries are full. But two, uh, they've built so many of these buildings with limestone. And to get to the limestone, they are tunneling underneath Paris, like 300 kilometers. And the buildings are getting closer together and taller and heavier. And the ground underneath is hollow. So some of these buildings are collapsing because the ground is Swiss cheese. So they're, they're, they need to empty these cemeteries and they need to shore up these tunnels. And so, you know, <laughs> for like a hundred years, they move just countless bones oh. down into these tunnels. And the first time I went down there, um, I was alone and I'm walking down and it's, you know, you get, you get they let you go business. alone. No, they got to have a tour guide or something, right? Well, no, I mean, it's the, the, the museum part that I went in, you just pay to get in and then you're on your own. Um, oh, but they so, block off certain entries because it goes on forever, right? Like miles and right. So okay. you can walk through probably close to a mile of it, but then there's other parts too. And if you know some people, they can tell you how to get in or where to sneak in. It's not legal, um, but did you sneak cat- into the parts? Uh, well, the, I went through the legit part okay. the first time. First time, and um, and so uh, <laughs> you go down there, and I mean, you know, there's like this spray paint from the old French underground like world war one and world war two. And, um, you know, it's, it's just this endless, you know, tunnel. And then finally there's a doorway that says in French, stop, this is the empire of the dead. And I walk through and man, there's just skeletons everywhere. I mean, bones, not skeletons. I mean, the, the bones There's like retaining walls of arm bones and leg bones and oh. these skulls just lined all around you. And I was just like the heebie jeebies everywhere. Right. But you, you'd sort of get used to it. And it's, it's, huh. it's not behind glass or anything. You can yeah. touch it. It's right there. Weird. Um, so I'm walking down this one long hallway and I mean, I could put my fingertips out and touch skulls on both sides. And I see this shadow, the size of a man just go from the right side to the left and back. And I just froze. And I went, okay, wait a minute. You know, I mean, maybe there's a little side tunnel and someone's down here with me and I didn't see. And then I look and no, there's no side tunnel. It's a straight away all the way. And then, you know, you look at the lighting. I'm I'm doing everything I can to try to figure it out or explain it. Yeah. And I couldn't. And at that point, I mean, I'd interviewed hundreds of people about their ghost experiences. And I was just like, this must be what they were talking about. I mean, I don't, I'm not psychic or sensitive. I can't tell the future. I can't talk to your dead grandmother, but something was there in front of me. And it took days, weeks, months to fully sink in. Hmm. Wow. That's, that's, yeah, that's pretty profound. I think you had another one too, that we'll get to, but that, that whole place just sounds so fast. Even if you hadn't seen anything, just seeing the real history there is amazing enough. I feel like. So the other thing too, is, you know, my last name, Belanger, yeah. uh, oh, when I'm in France, I pronounce it Belanger because it's, it's, <laughs> as, it's as common a name as like Baker is in the U S oh, it, it's so you would never, although, I mean, my family's been here so long, it's Belanger, right? I mean, sure. like my great grandparents were born in Massachusetts. You know what I mean? Like we're not that new here. Uh, so, um, but, but that's a super common name and, and they look in Canada too. They look at it and they just go, Oh, Belanger. And I was thinking, I was like, man, my DNA is in some of these bones somewhere, right? I mean, it's got to be, oh, right? That's crazy. I mean, the the to French think about. heritage has yeah. got to be running through someone here. And uh, I don't, I have no idea what I saw, if that played a role or not. I have no clue. Is it true there's people that, that, that's, that snuck into these illegal parts and went exploring and got lost and never found again? I could see that being possible, um, especially if there's, say, drugs involved, mm. um, <laughs> which you know, could very well be. Um, it, it's, you know, the part, the, the part where you go in, in the museum, you're not going to get lost. There's, there's people mm-hmm. that will walk around and, and make sure you're okay. And uh, it's, it's not that much of a, you know, a, it's not that much of a tunnel system right there, mm-hmm. uh, but it's just literally millions of bones, but the other parts underneath the city, like if you know your way in and there's bones in other parts of the city too, by the way, it's mm-hmm. not just right there. Um, but those aren't uh, kept up very neatly. And the only way to see those is, is illegally. So I spoke to a, they call themselves cataphiles, people that mm. just love the, the catacombs. And she was telling me how, um, you know, that, you know, they've all heard the stories about people getting lost down there. And you, you, I guess you could, if you didn't know what you're doing. And especially if you were altered in some way, like drunk or on drugs. Um, but in general, no, people don't, you know, don't get lost down there forever unless they're murdered or something. It's scary to think of though. Like if you did get, that's like the scariest place to get lost. And, and then I guess you'd just eventually die of starvation or something. I mean, 
I, what I a horrible way to it. go. I mean, I, I don't, I have a pretty good sense of direction. I always have. Oh, I don't. Mine's terrible. <laughs> so it seems to me, I'd be like, okay, circle, you know, just yeah. pick, pick a direction and go. You're going to hit something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're, you you're underneath like a major world city, like just go until you find some light or hear sound or something. Right. Yeah. No, I would definitely want a tour. Um, also, another one that was in your uh, book was uh, the Big Nose Kate's Saloon in Tombstone. And that's, I'm in Phoenix right now. So we've actually been to Tombstone. Um, and I, you didn't talk about the Birdcage Theater, which is, I thought that was the most. So the, the, the Big Nose Kate's is actually more haunted than the Birdcage? Uh, or? You know, it's, it's tough to rank these things, you know? I mean, I've, I've since been to the Birdcage. We, um, we filmed an episode of Ghost Adventures there. Yeah. Uh, so years ago. Gosh, it's been a while. But, um, but yeah, that whole town, which is like, it's, it's so, that town, you know, because you've been there, right? Like yeah. you walk down the street and you're like, that's the third wide herp I've seen. <laughs> and it's, it's not that big. Right. You know? Right. <laughs> well, the weird like, thing for me is that, um, explain this to me. Cause I go, I went to the birdcage theater and we did the night thing and we, they turn all the lights off and then they give you one of those monitors and to, you know, read for ghosts or whatever it is. But the one thing I didn't see or hear anything that was, I mean, that couldn't just be explained, but the one thing that was really weird is that there was a smell and they said, they told us that before that sometimes you can smell like cigarette smoke or something like that. And there was there, you know, there was a smell of cigarette smoke and I'm looking around, I'm not seeing any cigarette smoke. I don't know if it's coming in from another vent or something, but it was a very strong smell of cigarette smoke and multiple people smelled it. So I, I wasn't going crazy. What is, is that possibly some sort of a, a theory is that that could be some sort of ghost or paranormal experience? Yeah. I mean, you know, every human sense is, uh, has has some like sensitivity when it comes to paranormal like phantom smells is one of the most common things that that people report so for example it could be like grandma's perfume suddenly you're hmm. you're somewhere and you oh my gosh that's the scent my grandmother used to wear or or a, a cigar something strong where you're like no one's smoking a cigar around here the birdcage theater for those who don't know uh sure it was a theater but it was a place where the soil doves the prostitutes would, would kind of like ply their trade and they had these um you might recall the, the, the little like tent, like they had literally like just curtains hanging up curtains, on the, yeah. On the floors. Yeah. And like, you'd be doing your business with nothing but a bed sheet between you and the guy next to you doing his business. And, um, was that, is the birdcage the one that had the, the hearse in the back? Am I remembering? That I think correctly? so on the stage. So like you walk in and it's this, it really is like a giant theater, but then, yeah, there's these little rooms on the sides with, uh, curtains and then there's a couple other one or two rooms downstairs and a gambling room like in the basement yep. and it's the thing that's amazing about that is it's so well preserved because i guess they locked it up and they left they were going to go do something and come back and they locked it up and preserved it as it was and then they just never came back and then it wasn't opened until like the 60s or 70s or something well yeah when everybody sort of became enamored with the old west and tombstone yeah. became like a you know it's pretty kitsch let's be honest right I right mean, yeah, history was made there for sure, but at the same time, it's like you know, it's you're you're, you're living out your your old west uh, cowboy fantasies when you go there. Um, yeah, the birdcage is is really cool. If I remember too, right? Don't they have like quite a number of bullet holes around the ceiling? Yeah, and, like, I mean, yes, they're like, all over because I think when people would get excited or something, yeah. and they like so they just shoot like just right. for fun. It wasn't necessarily they're trying to kill somebody, but right. Like, where did those bullets land? Like, that's, that's literally the uh, old West. I mean, that's like, yeah. yeah. And I guess most, it's amazing because most of those places burned down, but because that yeah. one is made of stone or whatever, it's, it's still, and then like you said, the one that you said, the big nose Kate's, the swampers room is the thing is so he was like the janitor of the hotel and he had this basement room and built a tunnel from the mine yeah. to his, I mean, this is, I didn't, I don't think I saw this when I was there. I don't, is, can you do tours of that or. I, I mean, it's been a long time since I've been there. So. The swamper lived in the, the basement of Big Nose Cates, as you said. Now, the tunnel wasn't just built by the swamper. Uh, the miners would sneak up that tunnel into the bar, have a drink when they're supposed to be working, and then sneak back <laughs> to their job. So, like, you know, yeah. everybody kind of won. You know what I mean? So, right, like, if yeah. you're the owner of the bar, you're like, I don't mind putting in a secret entrance for people that are going to come spend a bunch of money in the middle of the day. Sure. Like, no problem. It's yeah. on you. You know, if you choose to skip out of work and pay me for a drink, I'm all right with that. Yeah. Um, so, but the swamper would, would go back down and, and like do some illegal mining. Uh, and that's, that's the, you know, that's a huge no, no. I mean, mm. um, you know, sneaking into a mine when you're not authorized and trying to take gold, like they'll shoot you for that. You know, like there's, there's no trial 
And they never found his stash, right? He had a stash of... That was what was believed, is that he had a a stash of of gold that he had hidden. People went looking for it. And um, and that's why they... That's the unfinished business, right? That's why he still haunts the place, is that he's still kind of protecting or looking for his uh, his gold stash. Well, yeah, and then there was some girl, there was a bar stool spinning and she was pinched or something. And the bar stool kept spinning. That's yeah, kind of creepy. that's right. Oh, God. It's, uh, you know, so keep in mind, I wrote that back in 2004. So oh, yeah. I'm going by memory here. Like, that oh, yeah, no, no, no. I, I got you. I, yeah. I got plenty yeah, yeah. of notes for you. So, yeah. yeah. No, and, and if I'm remembering correctly, too, they have mannequins up high. Yeah, I do that, remember that. that. Would, like, fall over and, you know, uh, so... The thing about a haunt is when you live or work in a location, you get very used to the normal sounds that it makes. Just mm-hmm. like think of where you live, right? You know uh, which which floorboard creaks when you step on it. You know, every time you're like, All right. oh, okay, I remember that. And you know what it sounds like when someone hmm. walks in and walks down the hall and shuts the door, you know, oh, oh you know, my my kid's home or my, my spouse or my partner, whatever. And so uh, it's the same of where you work. And so some of these folks, you know, they're the first ones in unlocking or they're the last ones out before they leave. And you see like a bar stool spinning and, you know, that doesn't happen unless someone just got up, but no one's around. Right. And it's little stuff like that. I mean, to me, that's that's actually way more frightening than what Hollywood dreams. of. Right. Because because like if blood was just pouring out of the wall and some demon face was coming out to try to eat you, that's pretty easy. You just get out. Yeah. Right. You just run for it. (laughs) Yeah, I would. You know, you're like, see ya. Yeah, like the Eddie Murphy joke when he's like, oh, this is a beautiful house. Yeah. Get out. Too bad we can't stay. See you later. <laughs> we would all do yeah, that. We would all do that. But us. it's more we- subtle. And then it starts to mess with your head. Like, am I going crazy? Like, did I just really hear that? And Did I see that? Is that bar still spinning? Or yeah. did I imagine that? And then you second guess yourself. And that chips away at you. Yeah. One event, you could be like, ah, I'm overtired or whatever. But, you know, over time, these little things add up. Did the mannequin just move? Uh, I, the shot glass just like slid down the bar, you know? And I mean, I know, you know, believe me, we've picked this stuff apart every which way. I know when there's like a, a small level of water on a bar, a glass can just slide right down, you know, floating literally on mm. that, little, you know, stuff can happen. Okay. That's good but to know. So, well, sure. But then sometimes, and again, when something weird happens, I'm the very first one to want to explain it to mm-hmm. be like, okay, is there water on the bar? Is that drink just sliding you know because of something that's natural and normal but just looks weird um did someone touch the bar stool like all these things and the best moments are when you go nope no one was anywhere near that bar stool and it's spinning right now (laughs) yeah i don't know what and that's the thing is like it's not necessarily that you say okay that's a ghost but even if you if you don't believe in ghosts i mean there's something weird going on right like there's if we can't explain it that's what I think of a lot of this stuff is so fascinating. Like I had an alien or uh, UFO researcher and it was the same kind of thing. Like sometimes you see these lights and it may not be aliens, but there's something going on that we don't, we can't explain. And that to me, that makes it so fascinating. Oh, absolutely. And the thing that's great about the paranormal and I mean, I don't just do ghosts anymore. Like I'm, I'm across the board with, with all, all I call them legends. And by legend, I don't mean fiction, right? Like mm. there's, there's a story that evolves around a thing. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. Roswell is, has a legend now. Roswell, New Mexico. Yeah. Alleged UFO crash. I was right? just this, there. It, right. So You've been to that the, museum? I mean, uh, the, oh, right by the alien. The UFO, yeah. the UFO researcher museum. Or I haven't been, mm. I haven't been, no. Um, it, but, but what I love about the whole topic, right. Is like, you get to ask the biggest questions that humans have ever asked, right. If you're talking about UFOs, you're asking, are we alone in the universe? If you're talking about ghosts, you're asking, what happens after we die? Is there an afterlife? And if you're talking about like Bigfoot or, or Loch Ness Monster or other cryptids, you're asking, do we know every creature that walks the earth with us? Hmm. And the reality is we, we're not sure. And that's, it's, it's in that fringe that we can have some incredible like discussions, thought experiments. We can bond because if I'm talking about ghosts, we're talking about like two really big uncomfortable issues, right? Like death, which is uncomfortable and the afterlife. If I were to talk about from a religious standpoint, everybody squirms. And I do too. I'm just like, oh, I don't want to hear about your religion, please. Can we not? Because you know? <laughs> like, uh, what are the chances we're going to totally see eye to eye? You and I were totally both raised Catholic. I, I, I oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. That's how yeah. we all feel. Yeah. Yeah. We're like, oh, it's come church on, is man, like don't... punishment. It's like, uh, I think that's how I was raised as a kid. It was like, oh, God, here we go. Like, yeah. Yeah. 
don't lay it on me, you know, like, uh, but uh, if I said, hey, can I tell you about this like crazy haunted house in this town? You'd be like, oh, cool. And if you don't believe in the afterlife, if you're an atheist, whatever, Mm -hmm. fine. Take it as just a story. There's still, there's still meaning and value in it. Um, There's still this connection to the past because the simplest definition of a ghost is that it's the past coming to the present. That's it. That's the simplest definition that I've seen. Uh, It's the past coming to the present, whether that's literal, like literally like a discarnate soul, like still hanging around for some reason or uh, figurative where we're just sort of remembering and recalling, you know, past events and bringing them to the present. I don't know. And maybe in some cases I I can tell you, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting either way. Um, Oh, another place I want to ask you about in the book, uh, because I'm from Washington and I've never heard of this one, Thornwood Castle. Do you remember this? I I think it's in Lakewood. I think it might be a bed and breakfast. Now you talked about a hidden room and tunnels in the basement and uh, it was interesting, too, because it said something about an unexplainable yet revitalizing energy. Like this was almost like a positive thing that people were feeling. Yeah. So Thornwood Castle was brought over brick by brick from England. And so oh. that was an expensive endeavor. Yeah. Right? And so in this case, you've got like not only the history of this building, but the history of the building when it stood, you know, thousands right. of miles away and had to be sailed this is before the days of the uh, Panama Canal. So it had to go all the way down around, you know, around the horn. Right. Wasn't it some rich guy that wanted to make this or something? It was dream home or something? Well, yes. When one brings a castle brick by brick over from England, one is rich. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> true. True. Yeah. yeah. I don't know any middle class. It wasn't for like, that. but I mean, it wasn't like a government project or some no, or the no, corporation. No, no. Or, yeah. Was, yeah. This was a wealthy eccentric saying, I know no. what I want. I want what's over there, over here. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the other part of it, so so layers happen with buildings like this. I forget which Stephen King story was made into a, a, a movie there, but it, it became a film set. And once that happens, like there's another layer of legend, right? That mm. the, the location becomes a celebrity. Hmm. And, um, and so there's question about like whether there's something attached to the old building that came with it or whether there's new stuff that happens there as well. Um, the revitalizing thing, one of the things that happens is that people that own uh, these haunted locations, especially when they become hotels or bed and breakfasts, their biggest fear is losing revenue. And so <laughs> you'd think uh, it so, would bring in some people too, though, because people want to get haunted or whatever, like freaks like us. It totally does bring in revenue and they got to walk the fine line of someone walking in going, this place is haunted. I don't want to stay here. I want my money back. And freaks like us going, I'll stay for the week. Put me yeah, in the most yeah. haunted room. Put me in That'll the most haunted place. I want to see it. Yeah. Which, yeah, I called, I called months ahead of time to make sure you saved me the most haunted room. Uh, and so, yeah, they got to walk that line. And so the whole revitalizing energy, uh, you know, sometimes to me, that's almost like revisionist, you know, where mm-hmm. you're just, you know, it's just people trying to like please all parties. And mm-hmm. I mean, a haunt, the funny thing about a haunt is that, I mean, it's not up to me what's haunted, right? It's, it's a collective decision. Uh, someone has an experience. Maybe they post it on the internet. Maybe they they put it in TripAdvisor. I stayed in room blah blah blah, and this happened. So weird. I heard the place was haunted, and I saw it for myself. Or the inverse of that. I went there because it's haunted. I didn't see squat. Nothing happened. Nothing weird. No weird feelings. It's bull. The place isn't haunted at all. End of story. Which you know doesn't end the story at all. But it's their opinion. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I love that they went there looking for it. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. No, I stayed at the one. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Jerome, another Arizona town. Oh, there's yeah. a there's a mental hospital or used to be a mental hospital. Now it's a hotel. We stayed there. And I definitely there I didn't Grant. sleep well. You know, it was like a lot of creaky noises and stuff. I don't know if they necessarily heard or saw ghosts, but it, it definitely is on your mind. And I was like, oh, this is actually not as fun as I thought. Like I because like, you don't sleep. You're like thinking about it. You're like you're worried. It's it's kind of creepy. Did you uh, eat at the haunted hamburger? Oh yeah, or- many times. I love that yeah. place. Great view, yeah. great view. Um, what about? Uh, you, we got to talk about this one. The suicide forest in Japan. Even yeah. regardless of paranormal, this is just a very fascinating thing that people go in here uh, to kill themselves, and they actually have signs like "Don't do it." And uh, there's just dead. I guess there's dead bodies off the pass, but they they warn you not to go off the hiking pass, and they actually monitor it with police video or something. Yeah, so the Suicide Forest, uh, that legend only goes back a few decades. You know, mm. I, I think it was the 60s. There was a, a novel written, uh, a hack pulp novel, uh, just total ripoff of Romeo and Juliet, star-crossed lovers. You know, the story's been told and retold. 
and they they decide to uh, take their own lives in the suicide forest, which sit, sits below the iconic Mount Fuji, like it's a very picturesque place, and they decide to do it there. And someone read that book and said, and they were suicidal, and they said, I'm going to go there to do this, and then hmm. they did it, and then another person did it. And this there's a, a concept called the spirit of place, and I don't care what you believe in or don't believe in, that is the number one place in the world to take your own life. More than the number, Golden Gate Bridge, right? Number two is the Golden Gate Bridge. Number two is the Golden Gate Bridge. And the reason that is, is for the same exact reason for the suicide forest. Someone went there and did it. And then someone else did it. And suddenly it became like this, uh, this sort of romantic idea that this is a place to go if you're feeling suicidal. And you know the crazy thing, especially like Golden Gate Bridge, right? Some people jump and they don't die. It just hurts a lot and you break a bunch of bones and you get fished out. Mm -hmm. Um, But yet, I mean, that's, that, that became a popular place. There's like this, this air of disaster over it. There's a spirit of place because so many people have gone there to take their lives. Same with the suicide forest. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I I got to interview a guy is an American, but actually I, he owns like some, some like little cafe right near it. And he had said, he's like, you know, you can see the look on people's faces when he's like, you know, some of them are walking in there with no intent of walking out. Ugh. It's just, it's a look. You just That's know. It. And, uh, and, and it is sad and it's horrible. And the, the yeah. crazy thing about suicide is that it is contagious. It is a contagious illness, uh, especially among peer groups. You know, like if you, um, you know, if, if you, if you've ever gone to like high school or college and like one person committed suicide, you got to watch the close friend group, right? Because sometimes mm-hmm. someone else might. Families, even worse, you know, a brother commits suicide, then another brother might. Yeah, I they mean, see it's... how much attention that person is getting and they want that yeah. sometimes. Yeah, it's interesting though with the Golden Gate Bridge thing, the, like you said, the people that jump and then they survive, the thought that goes into their head right after they jump is, I wish I didn't do this. I wish I, this was a mistake. This yeah. was a mistake. But at that point, it's too late. And then, yeah, but if they survive then the, now they're hurt or whatever. But so it's like, it's interesting. I think people sometimes think it's an, a good idea, but it rarely ever is the right path in my opinion. No. And, and this is why, this is why I include stories like these, right? Because the past haunts us because it's supposed to, because history repeats and we make the same old mistakes that our ancestors have made mm-hmm. and so on. So if we can read these stories and be like, Oh man, but, you know, it doesn't sound so romantic. It doesn't sound so glamorous to have my rotting corpse discovered a couple of weeks later. Uh, for what, you know? Yeah. And, um, and so I, th- I think with a lot of these places, the reason a place is haunted is because we, the living, keep that story around. We keep talking about it. We keep talking about that unsolved murder because it, you know, it just eats away at us. Even if it was a hundred years ago, uh, we talk about, um, you know, the, the horrible dark thing that happened inside someone's home or sometimes haunts are actually sort of friendly. Like the, the person was happiest at this location and they're going to just keep sticking around there. Hmm. Um, we can sort of relate to that. You know, yeah. like I, I would love to go to my happy place for all eternity when this is over. Right. Yeah. No. And it's interesting too, on that suicide force, they have, you said in the book, they have signs about counseling, but also mm-hmm. signs about credit counseling because yeah. like a lot of it is like financially uh, motivated, like they're bankrupt or whatever. So it's like, Hey, we can help you get out of debt. Like, don't kill yourself. Like I thought that was like really interesting. Like, have you, did you go to that one? Cause did you go to all these locations or only some of them? I've been to most of them, but I didn't get to go to Japan yet. Sadly. No. Okay. Um, You should hike the mountain too, Mount Fuji. That that's a two day hike. I would uh, would totally want to do that. It's on my list. That's very cool. Um, let's see. God, there's so many good ones in here. The spaghetti warehouse. I guess I I looked this up because I was like, I was actually just near Houston. Uh, but I guess this location is closed, but this one's weird because, um, somebody was walking upstairs and, uh, there was a, a big, a bunch of chairs stacked or something. This is like, reminds me of the movie Poltergeist where the, where the, yeah. the chairs get stacked. Right. I remember talking to that person. Yes. Yeah, so spaghetti warehouse it is a chain. I don't even know if they're still around. I mean, that restaurant, you, as you said, was closed, but, um, you know, the, it's the building, right? It's not the chain. Sure. Just, that sure. Was the, that was the business that was in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the employees I talked to said they, they came upstairs and there's like these wooden chairs and someone, you know, you can stack one on the other by giving it like a little quarter twist, right? If you follow me. Mm-hmm. And then you can put another one on top of that by doing a quarter twist and so on and so on. And someone had stacked chairs like way, way up. And it's one of those things, especially, you know, when you're the last person to lock up 
after like an event or whatever, and you're the first one in the next morning or afternoon, and you go upstairs and you see that. It's just one of the, and, you know, keep in mind, the place has a haunted reputation and maybe you've had other experiences. This is one of those things where you're just like, whoa, you know, uh, there's something to this, you know, there's, there's absolutely something going on here. And it's just an attention getting mind bender. Can't explain it. Don't know why or to what end, but that's what that person reported. That's, that's a crazy one. And then um, the last location in this book I want to talk about is the, uh, the Waverly Hills sanatorium in, in Louisville, Kentucky. I guess a lot of people had died of tuberculosis there, but this mm-hmm. is another one where you had an experience. So tell us about the experience you had there. Yeah. So uh, the, there were these tuberculosis asylums all over the, the nation, right? And there was a time where that was a real plague that was just, I mean, to give you some perspective, between the year 1800 and 2000, 200 year span, tuberculosis has claimed more than one billion with a B lives Dang. worldwide. Yeah. Worldwide. And it's still one of the biggest killers out there. It's just, it's under control in this country. Mm. Um, so you don't really hear about it much anymore. Um, but there was a time when people went to these asylums and, uh, when I say asylum, people think mental asylum, there were also health asylums. Hmm. So it was a, it was a tuberculosis asylum. Sanitarium is, uh, what they call it. And this building is absolutely massive. Like six stories tall, I think. And like this giant bat wing building, like 400 rooms. And the first time I walked up to it, I mean, it's, it's been empty since the late eighties. And I just felt like, whoa, I mean, and I don't really get feelings. I just, you know, I could be excited to go someplace, but I walked in and man, this place felt like there's this feeling of being watched. It felt crowded. It felt like dozens of people were there with us and all around you. It was so eerie. So I'm going upstairs and it's getting later and later into the night. There's no windows. It's all wide open. There's like vines and trees growing into the building. It's abandoned. Um, And all these rooms what they could do for you is they, they would literally like just open the doors and push your, roll your bed out to give you fresh air. Like that was the treatment back in the thirties and forties, you know I mean? Uh, and there was some minor surgeries they could do, but tuberculosis would eat away at your lungs. Uh, and I thought about, imagine like, imagine coughing coming from every room around you 24 hours a day. Cause Ugh. everybody's just get, you know, like wet, nasty coughing. Yeah. And it, it must have just been horrible. And how many people were brought to this facility and they're they're looking at it and thinking, this is my last address. I'm not oh. leaving here on my own feet, right? I mean, the, the point was to try to keep you comfortable. Some people recuperated, but hmm. like hundreds and hundreds did not. You know, I mean, that was the last stop and a lot of people died there. And uh, And that's, you feel that, right? And I don't, think of that as like a psychic sense. I think of it as like basic human empathy. Like if you walked into mm-hmm. a hospital, like visiting someone and you see a family that's weeping because they just lost a loved one, your heart hurts a little, right? You sure, don't even know yeah. them, but you're like, you can imagine and you go, oh, I'm so sorry, right? Like I, I, I know what that pain is like. I'm mm-hmm. sorry, strangers that you're going through it. Like you feel that in the room, you feel the sadness mm-hmm. and you feel that in Waverly. And so it was like one in the morning and there were four of us uh, standing right where the, the, the building bends. So you could see way down this hallway, way down that hallway. And we were talking about like nothing, like just nothing in particular. And this man steps out into the hallway, like just, and we all got quiet at the same time. And I said, did you just see that? I said, you mean the guy that just stepped out like four doors down on the left? I was like, "Uh uh-huh. And and we raced to the door because we're like, who's up here with us, right? No one's supposed to be here. And, and we're looking in all the rooms as we get there and, and we look and there's no one there, like nobody. And the only two ways out of this room were either in the hallway where we were and we would have mm-hmm. seen you or leap out the third story window and we would have heard that. Hmm. And there's no one there. And all four of us look at each other and are just like. And so four of you saw this. It wasn't just four. That's yeah. see, that's what it makes it even stronger when there's numbers of people that see it. Well, you yeah. talk about um, that, that you just uh, triggered my memory when you said, you know, you walk into these places and you feel like the pain. So I was just in uh, Louisiana and we walked on this plantation. I don't think you had any Louisiana locations in the book, did you? I, I honestly don't. Remember. I don't think so. I think I wrote down every. But um, we were in this plantation and we're in the slave quarters. And it's like that feeling. You're just like, God, I can't. This is so weird. And you see like they have the some of the tools, the chains and stuff. And you're just like, this is so such a creepy feeling. But uh, Which I mean, plantation were you in? 
Oh God, I'm forgetting the name. It's a, uh, oh, I can't remember, but it was, it was beautiful house and uh, these beautiful oak trees. Oh, something about the trees. Those are the name. I can't remember, but uh, yeah, I don't know if there's ghosts or anything, but it, it, t- talk about New Orleans or Louisiana, uh, because even if it wasn't on your list, I'm sure you've been there for some of your yeah. ghost adventures or something like, and the voodoo and the, like that whole state just fascinates me. I find it so fascinating. Yeah. So uh, ghost adventures on the travel channel. I've been the writer and researcher for yeah. every episode since, since 2008, the right? Since the yeah, since episode and it's one. still going, it's still going. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, we, yeah, we filmed a, a few spots around new Orleans and around, uh, Louisiana, New Orleans, new Orleans. I was just there just before COVID. So like two years ago, I guess, okay. but, um, there's so many different cultures that sort of intersect there, right? You've got this like, like Haitian voodoo and you've got Roman Catholic and you've got like the slave trade was so big there. And yeah. there's just so many, like the, the, the French Creole influence, um, piracy, right? So many pirates. Uh, Jean Lafitte and all these people, right? So you've got so many different uh, cultures coming together. It's no wonder they gave us gumbo, right? I mean, like, what's gumbo? Oh, there you go. Like yeah. everything in the pot, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, that's New Orleans, and there's that's a city that's very matter of fact about their hauntings, you know, and and their their weirdness, their vampires and things like that. Um, God, I mean, I met I met people that were literally in a vampire cult, you know, in, in New Orleans. And so I kind of feel like all that human energy, it leaves a mark. It leaves a mark wherever you go. And some of those buildings just have a story to tell, um, you know, whether it's, you know, it was involved in the slave trade, which which haunts us literally and should haunt us. Right. We should we should talk about that. We should understand that humans were, were bought and sold, you know, in this place. And that and that's not OK. Um, and let that haunt us. So it never happens again. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, yeah, that's like why I, I think said, it's important. They have, they keep it. And so you can see, like, you should see that yeah. and be horrified and then go, okay, like we have to learn from the history. Like you said. Yeah, no. Yeah. And th- and that's, I mean, that's just one role that, that ghosts can play. Right. It's like literally mm-hmm. haunting us, mm-hmm. uh, from the past, because sometimes we do repeat mistakes, uh, historical mistakes. We do horrible things again, uh, to people and to ourselves and, um, you know, and, and so if these, if we talk about these stories, maybe there's a chance that we won't repeat it in the future. That's the sincere hope. And, and again, I, again, that's what makes the place haunted is that we're sort of collectively talking about it. Not, mm-hmm. not just some authority comes in and says, it's haunted. I've taken EMF readings and, uh, I, I looked at this or that, and therefore I rubber stamp it as haunted. No, it's, it's a community's decision to call it that. And whether you believe or disbelieve that reputation, per, you know, it carries on it doesn't go away yeah well so i watched a couple of these shock doc things i think you were i think you weren't in this one though it said you were but then when i watched it i was like wait i didn't see you in it but you must be familiar with the case about um uh the the mur- the, the little boy david and then the the demon goes into arnie and then this arnie guy kills the devil made me do it is oh, a, devil it's, made it. yeah sorry i should have just said Chuck, that you might have missed that one i was in that one extensively <laughs> wait were you i was in it a lot <laughs> yeah. why did it seem like you weren't in it I had the first and last word in it. <laughs> like I'm going to have a, to. Okay. Yeah. Cause it, it seemed like you, ah, that's so strange. Yeah. Cause I, I, yeah. the Amityville one, I know you're in that one, but, but anyway, so yeah, the devil made me do it. What, what are your thoughts on that? Just, I mean, people should yeah. watch it, but uh, just to summarize real quick, explain to people this case and what are your thoughts on it, your final thoughts? Yeah. So that case was really personal to me because that I grew up in Sandy Hook, Connecticut, which is part of Newtown, Connecticut. And Newtown is where that whole thing started. Like that's where the the haunting that led to this whole thing. I mean, the Conjuring Three movie, by the way, mm-hmm. the latest Conjuring movie is all based on this particular case. Right. So uh, Arnie Johnson, he's 18 years old. He's moving in with his 26 year old girlfriend and her child from a previous relationship, and they've rented this house in Newtown. And something's weird about the house. And uh, Debbie Glatzel, his girlfriend, uh, is from Brookfield, which is the next town to Newtown. It's town. They're just a few miles away. And uh, her little brother comes over to help them move in and she sees something in the bedroom. And that's the start of this whole thing. It, like this creepy old man's ghost that then follows the kid back to their house in Brookfield, a few miles away. The kid becomes possessed. The church gets involved. The church recommends they call in Ed and Lorraine Warren, uh, who are just two towns over, super close. And the Warrens get involved and they claim this is one of the worst cases of like diabolical possession they've ever seen. And progressing quickly. Uh, By the end of the summer, this is all 1981, by the way. By the end of the summer, 
uh, the, the young boy will go through a series of exorcisms and ultimately be cleared. But at one point, Arnie Johnson is seeing this kid literally getting beaten by some force that no one else can see. And he jumps on the kid and says, you know, pick on someone your own size, pick on me, you know, and sort of inviting the demon in. <sighs> and so um, after the exorcism, things are quiet. But then fast forward to the following February of 1982, and uh, I might have the year off by one, but anyway, so it's the following February and um, De uh, Debbie and Arnie are living in an apartment uh, and they're, they're partying with their landlord and a fight ensues. And the next thing we know, the landlord drops dead. He's just been stabbed and Arnie just kind of walks off and he's arrested very quickly. The guy dies from the wound and it's the first murder in Brookfield history, the whole history of the town right? Like that's how small of a town we're talking. There's never been a murder. And so for the police, it's open and shut. They'd been drinking all day. There was a fight. Someone had a knife. Someone got stabbed. Someone's dead. And it should have been pretty open and shut at the very least manslaughter, you know, but, but maybe even murder. But then Ed and Lorraine Warren jump in and say, no, 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 no. Arnie Johnson was demonically possessed and shouldn't be held accountable for his actions. The devil made him do it. This this and so what turned what would have been a pretty low key, you know, only for the local papers kind of thing turned into a national and an international story, as the Warrens are lining up experts to come in and take the stand and talk about demonic possession and evil and exorcism and all this stuff because the Warrens wanted to prove their life's work on the stand. Mm -hmm. That was their objective. Like I don't even think it. I mean Arnie, who cares? And I'm you know the victim. I don't think any of that mattered at that point. It was an opportunity to get in the spotlight and talk about demons and evil and the devil. And just when the case is about to start, uh, the judge, and rightfully so, I think, said, we're not hearing any of that. Like, whether the devil or someone else made him do it is irrelevant. His hands on the knife. We're, we're dealing with those facts only. Hmm. I'm not going to even hear testimony from these other people, but, but it, it really sort of gripped the world. You know, you put your hand on the Bible and you swear to tell the truth. So help you God. Yeah. So the court believes in God, but do they not believe in the devil? Which brings us back to the whole, can one live without the other? There you go. Uh, and, and then and, he ended, but, sorry, go on. You no, know, but I'm just saying like, had the judge allowed it, don't you think every uh, person accused of murder that point forward in every state in this country would say like, Hey, the devil made me do it. Right. Yeah. They would use that. That's true. But so then yeah. they end up convicting him of only manslaughter and then he only does five years, but wasn't it partly due because it was kind of self-defense. Well, right. So manslaughter is not the, necessarily the wrong charge when people yeah. are drunk and in a fight. Right. Right. Like, you know, yeah. I mean, punches are getting tossed each way and then someone's dead. So manslaughter is not, I don't think that's inappropriate. And he's a first time offender, never been arrested for anything. He was sentenced to 10 years, but only served five. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, you uh, know what? I, I think it was, I did. What's the way? Are you in the Amity of a horror house? Shock doc. It was one of them that says you're in it and you're not. Maybe that was the one I watched that you're not in. I, that was all my, uh, George Lutz audio. And I was in it. Oh, okay. Uh, I think they had like one little sound bite. From oh, it okay. That. That's the one I'm thinking. Cause that's the next one I'm yeah. going to ask you about. Cause this one is the one that really shocked me as a kid. I saw the movie and it scared the hell out of me. I was in like fourth grade. And the thing that scares you is it says like, this is based on a true story. And yeah. so you think like this shit is when you're in fourth grade, you think this is like there's blood, could, blood could come out of the walls and all this. So obviously, you know, I become older you know, wiser, whatever. And, you know, you learn that some of this stuff was exaggerated. However, you talk to George Lutz and he says that a lot of the things that the basic things that happened did truly happen. Yeah. George, you know, again, the stuff he talked about, I think is more frightening than a movie per se. And this was the last interview. George Lutz is the guy that like, it's his story that all mm -hmm. the movies and books have been made from and uh, everything. Right. And so this was the last interview he ever gave because after that, the third movie had come out he got involved in a like his 13th lawsuit and then he died. Um, but so some of the, one of the things he talked about that, that, that was scary to me was now keep in mind, set this up. Six people were murdered in that house. That's not a legend or lore like that happened. Yeah. Right. Uh, and they were, they were murdered, murdered by their, their brother slash son. So Ronald Butch DeFeo Jr. Went into that house with a rifle, shot his two parents dead in their beds then shot his two brothers dead in their beds and his two sisters dead in their beds. That uh, happened. Yeah. And the creepy thing to me that I don't, I don't think I knew this before until I saw that documentary was that they kept the beds 
What the hell are they? I can't imagine that they left the same. I think they took the mattresses out, but they kept the same bed frames. That is bizarre I, to me. Yeah, it's the whole thing's bizarre. And so, look, I'm a guy that's way into this stuff. And if you said, hey, Jeff, I'll give you the Amityville house. I own it. You can live there rent free. I don't want to. Like, right. That's just creepy to me. I don't want to live where six people were executed. No. Uh, but the Lutz has got a deal. You know, that house sat mm -hmm. empty for like a year. The price keeps coming down as one would expect. And they bought it. And they said to quote George, you know, houses don't have memories. I disagree. And actually, he would probably disagree with himself at this point. But hmm. uh, but that was their thought when they moved in. And he talked about like early on, he's laying in bed at night. And he said, I heard what sounded like a marching band tuning up downstairs and he said you know i mean like just you know blowing notes and like sort of warming up and you get up you're like what's going on is a radio on or, or hmm. is, is something what's and so he he starts walking down the stairs and he sees the black lab their, their black lab dog asleep at the bottom of the stairs and he's like if there really was a sound that loud the dog would not be asleep so therefore uh-oh is it up is it up in my head mm -hmm. or is it really happening in this house and so now he's unnerved, you know, am I going crazy? And it turns out everyone in the family was sort of having little experiences like that and afraid to tell each other because mm -hmm. they were all sort of going through the same thing, like hmm. little things that were just chipping away. In the movie, there was that swarm of flies in one of the rooms, right? Right. He talked about, well, there was one room where there was just always flies. Two. Or, he's like, it wasn't a swarm. It was like one or two or three, but then you'd kill them. And later that day, there's more. There was always like one or two. You could never seem to kill them all. Um, and that, of course, got exaggerated in the book and then in the movies until it turned into like, you know, millions and millions of flies. Right. Um, but but yeah, so little things would happen. Uh, but then, you know, they, they would hear the kids screaming for help upstairs and they couldn't get through the door to help them. And then they could and it would stop and the beds are, are shaking and things like that. They were only in the house four weeks. And, and George was talking to a priest friend who said, is there somewhere you can go to just get a good night's sleep somewhere else? He said, yeah, Kathy, his wife, his, her mother doesn't live too far away. He's like, why don't you go there and just get some rest? And, and they did. And, um, and then never went back, according to George, never mm -hmm. went back to that house. Moved to San Diego and, and started a new life. Sold the rights to their story, uh, which was made into a book by Jay Anson, which was then made into those movies, you know, one right. and then two and then three. And, and here we are still talking about the Amityville house. And then no, but the people that have lived there since nobody has come forward and said that they've heard anything or, or saw anything. Yeah, so that's, that's kind right. of, and not only that, the, the house, it was for sale. I want to say like last year or something, mm. I think it was like 900,000 bucks or, or maybe it was like a million more than I have anyway. Um, and again, I, I, I don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. It's creepy. If it was, if it was 20 bucks, I'm not sure. Well, I'd, I'd probably buy it for 20, but you could sell uh, it. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, so th the thing about that house is that it, it's, it's got this like black cloud over it, you know, and that's not going to change. Um, no matter what, there was a murder there. And mm -hmm. then now it's, it's the, like one of the most infamous houses in America and it's a very upscale wealthy neighborhood. I've been by the house a couple times, you know I mean? I went to college not far from there. So the first time I saw it, you know, I met a buddy. He's like, oh, I'm from Amityville. He goes, you want to see the house? So I was like, yeah, I want to see the house. Can you, you know, get you close to it? Or like, I know like with the Breaking Bad, I went to the Breaking Bad house in New Mexico and there's like people out there kind of staring at you, giving you dirty looks. I hate that stuff. So yeah, you'll get dirty looks. You'll get people okay. yelling at you. But um, I mean, the house like is, is, I don't know, 30 feet from the sidewalk. You could throw us, you could hit it with a spitball. Like, I mean, but, but you're, you're free to drive down that street. You're free to walk down that sidewalk, mm -hmm. um, but you're not supposed to trespass. And the thing is they're smart enough not to put a bunch of signs or fences around it because mm. that would be like, you know, flashing neon. This is the Amity. Right. Place. Right. Those, 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 they changed the windows. windows. Yeah. yeah. They're gone. The windows are gone and the street's been renumbered. So oh, uh, it, it was 112 Ocean Avenue was the, the house. And, and if you drive down the street, it's not 112 mm. anymore. Okay. But if you, I mean, it's not really hard to find. If yeah. You yeah. Do, you no. know, we can figure it out. Of research. Yeah. So we got to talk about this before you go. Uh, Cause this is the most famous scary thing is the exorcist, uh, which is based on the exorcism of uh, Roland Doe. And I watched this uh, of the shock docs too. This was really well done. I, I really liked this one. Um, so it all started with the Ouija board that they, that's why they think the kid. And did you, did you write a book on Ouija boards as well or? Yeah. I, so I wrote a book on spirit communication and I had a okay. whole chapter on Ouija board. Like a whole chapter. And it, was, 
yeah, it was like the the history of of Ouija boards, um, you know, and and what people have done with them. It's an incredible piece of Americana. It's not really accurate to blame the 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 possession on the Ouija board. It was there was a Ouija board involved with Roland, but it was one of those things where like it was sort of mentioned in passing. And the reason everybody's put so much focus on the Ouija board is really because of a guy named William Peter Blatty, who wrote the book and then the movie, The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. He needed some sort of way to get the demon into the little girl, Reagan, mm. right? And uh, and so for him, her using the Ouija board alone was kind of like, that was the way. That was okay. the way that the, the demon passed through. But if you watch that movie and look at it as like just a, a story from a story perspective, does a, a demon that powerful really need you to touch a piece of cardboard and plastic? I'm just asking for a true, friend, true. Right? Like, no, that's a good point. But yeah, I think in the real story was the ant died, and they thought they thought maybe it was the ant. But then yeah, all this crazy stuff happens, and and I think the interesting thing about that documentary is they talk about this is coming from a priest's uh, journal or something yeah. that they they wrote about, and then the they say that according to this priest that the the kid or the bed or the kid both levitated like eight inches off the floor. Cause there's some people that say, Oh, this kid faked it. He shook the bed and he shook the bookshelves. But if you're levitating, I mean, unless the priest is lying, I don't know. Well, so, so that's the thing, right? Um, this case uh, was well, actually not a lot of people knew about it at the time. It mm. was just sort of quietly dealt with. Um, but then it started to get some notoriety because there was a lot of witnesses the kid goes out to St. Louis uh, to stay with his aunt and uncle. And it was there that he went through all the series of exorcisms, both at the rectory uh, of the priest, but then also at the Alexian brothers hospital, which is no longer standing anymore. And it was in the hospital that, I mean, people that's, that's where the story starts to spread because the staff witnessed some crazy stuff. It yeah, wasn't there 48 um, witnesses or something to all this stuff. There was a lot. Yeah. And, and, and it was the hospital. I mean, you know, hospital is a busy place. There's there's visitors, there's nurses and doctors and uh, priests and, and uh, you know, um, custodians, every kind of person, you know, that walks by a, a hospital wing. And so there was a lot, a lot of witnesses and it freaked everybody out. But the the exorcisms were ultimately successful and Roland went on to live his life. William Peter Blatty got the old notes because uh, it had made the newspapers, made the local papers. And Blatty started digging into it and used that as sort of the basis for the, the whole idea that, you know, you've got these, these priests battling evil. And I mean, it's still an absolute masterpiece of horror. I mean, it's, I mean, few movies have held up like that. Um, you know, over time we, we've, we've become so desensitized or our expectations of like, you know, things like uh, special effects have, have gone so high uh, but that movie still holds up. It's still so frightening. The idea that, you know, something, you know, something could just attack an innocent little girl just because it wants to. Mm -hmm. Well, one ex alternate explanation that I find equally as fascinating, though, is that um, in that documentary, they talk about a professor uh, from the Manhattan Project that I think helped develop the nuclear bomb came to see this kid. And uh, and he was freaked out and he was talking about something about electromagnetism or something. They didn't really go into it very much in the documentary, but I was trying to Google that. And I was like, well, this is really interesting. This guy's like a scientist and he's saying something's going on. Right. Well, right. And so uh, and it's funny because you say electromagnetism. Is that, that the right meter, term? Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, so that 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 meter they gave you when you went on your little ghost. Hunt yeah. Yeah. Was, was probably an EMF meter, electromagnetic mm -hmm. force meter that measures fluctuations now keep in mind we live on a giant magnet called earth uh and if we didn't live on that magnet we would die because that that magnetic field keeps out all those deadly sun rays and mm -hmm. things like that um so uh, and, and there's there's electromagnetic forces around us all the time however sometimes really weird stuff happens with these meters where the, you see you measure these spikes uh, and some people are are highly sensitive to it so there's folks mm. that like can't walk under high tension power lines they'll get headaches and uh, mm. Some people could even go so far as hallucinating. So it's very natural to want to look for a cause when you see something that just doesn't compute, you know, but if the kid was that sensitive to electromagnetism, like, I don't know, he was in Baltimore, he was in St. Louis, wouldn't he be somewhere where he'd be fine? Well, yeah. And then the weird thing too, is that like the real story, again, I, this is stuff I never heard of. He went to, did he go to Gonzaga prep? Cause that's in uh, Spokane, Washington, where a lot of my family's from. And then he becomes a rocket scientist and he works for NASA and he has all these patents and stuff. He's a real person. And yeah. you actually tried to track him down and send him a letter, but 
I did track him down. I did send him a letter. So you have found yeah. his address, but you didn't go knock on the door. You sent him a letter. You know, tra- he doesn't live that close to me, but okay. I, and I also, I, I'm not that guy. Like I'm just, if you, because yeah. here's the thing. That's, that's good you, though. No, because here's the, if you, I can't force you to share a story. With right. Me, right. If you're not a willing participant in this, it, it does me no good. Right. It like, makes it more need- fascinating though, that he doesn't want to tell like, why is he, there, and then the church is hiding it too. The church tried to hide it. That's what's so weird about this thing too. And I don't know. Well, the church, the church has a funny relationship with exorcism, you know? Um, yeah. I, I remember I did a, a story. I worked on a story on this and I talked to uh, a, a, a priest from the, the church I grew up in, the Catholic priest. So since like the 1970s, they don't teach priests how to do exorcisms anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, it used to be standard. Everybody learned, you know, exorcism, baptism, like all the various rites, and they don't teach it anymore because the Catholic church views um, baptism as an exorcism. So when you're baptized, whatever is there is out very peaceful one, very, you know, like candles and take pictures. But um, when someone believes they need an exorcism, it's actually this whole rigmarole. You report it to your priest who reports it to the diocese, who launches an investigation, who reports it to the archdiocese, who eventually sends it up to Rome, who then flies in some exorcist who knows how to do this. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's like, it's a very big thing and it's kept very secret. They don't like to talk about it. But see, and, why do you think it's secret? Because I feel like if it, it if it was real, then isn't that proof that the, again, we go back to our original conversation. If there's proof of this, that this is real, then isn't there proof of the good things too? Like that would kind of prove that maybe their religion is, is legit. So it, it would put butts in seats, don't you think? Well, yeah, but get people to go to church for sure. Yeah. That, yeah, I, I hear you. And yet, if I truly thought, like, say, someone close to me in my family needed an exorcism, I would not want them on, like, say, daytime talk shows being trotted out by the by the church. So it's trying and, to respect the privacy of the victims. And Right. Okay. Right. Like, do you want to be the guy that that had an exorcism and was on all the, the talk shows when he was like 25? and now can't get a job or anything. Right. You know what I mean? like, yeah. You don't want to be like, known as that guy. Yeah. And so I think that's probably with Roland Doe. And by the way, Roland Doe, Doe being like the anonymous last name, his sure. last name was not Doe. And so, um, so there was always this sort of attempt to, to keep his, his private life private. Um, and yet this is something that goes on. And by the way, you know, Catholics don't have the own only, you know, market on exorcisms. There's Jewish exorcism. There's, huh. Uh, you know, there's, there's uh, Protestant exorcisms, there's uh, Muslim, uh, Buddhist, every, you know, every sort of faith has this way to deal with, uh, with a person that has some sort of attachment, which is really interesting to me. Yeah, the whole, um, that whole thing, that whole case though, the Roland Doe, because, and then I guess the construction workers found a copy of the bishop's diary in the psychiatric hospital, and then the furniture was moved from the hospital to a military base, which is weird, and then they yeah. lost it. And then the priest, he was trapped into a mental hospital for the rest of his life because he went crazy from this. I, I don't know. This was all in the documentary, uh, yeah, all yeah, fascinating yeah. stuff. Again, I don't know how much the truth is stretched or what, but if any of that's true, it's fascinating stuff. Most of that is true. I don't know about the priest being in a mental hospital. I really don't. I thought like, they said I, that I, in the documentary that he was locked in a room or something and that the people were hearing noises and or he he struggled after that or something. No, I'm I'm sure. No, he did struggle. I remember talking to his niece uh, who said that, yeah, he lost a lot of weight. Like he really had to recuperate. Like you might have to recuperate from like major surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, but him, I don't recall him any story about the, the you know, going into a, a mental institution, the furniture being saved and going to a military base. That's true. Um, I worked on that. I, I spoke to the military base and yeah. I said, look, this is what it, and then, and by the way, like they were, I, I believe they were truly honest with me because they were like, so some furniture was moved into a storage unit we had on this base, like literally in the 1940s. And at some point it gets so much dust on it. It's very clearly junk. And I'm guessing that at some point someone just threw it away because we were clearing out the oh, building. See, I was picturing more like the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right. I yeah, was right, picturing yeah. that, that it was going in this military base and it was sealed up. And maybe that's just the story they told you because that's maybe what it really like, is. Right. Yeah. There's like there's like six armed guards in front of this like room full of yeah. old furniture, right? And they're like, no, you can't even look at it. 
okay, this is weird. You know, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I tend to believe sometimes the simplest explanation is, is often true. So the idea that they were giving up some of their, their precious storage space for hospital furniture that will never be used again. Like, I don't know, I've never run a military base, but I could see being like, yeah, I need the space. Get rid of it. <laughs> right. You right. Know? Yeah. No, totally. So. Um, well, I know you got to get going. So I do want to wrap up. Uh, I'd like to end with a charity, but kind of like to lead into that was this, um, we didn't have as much time to talk about this book. Uh, ah, here it is. That's a better yeah. angle of it. Uh, but really cool. What you did is you kind of, you took, you took this hike in Kilimanjaro um, kind of as a tribute to your, your brother-in-law. Uh, who, yeah. who died of cancer. It's a really sad story because he was, it's scary too, because he was like my age. And uh, so you did this chat and it's all about your hike and people should read that. And, and also what I really love about the book is the, uh, the pictures, the pictures yeah, are beautiful. Thanks. It was like one of the most transformative experiences I ever had. Um, I, I'm a hiker. I always wanted to do Kilimanjaro. And then in 2016, my brother-in-law died from, uh, sorry, 2015, he died from cancer. If they're like a two year battle, and I say battle, but like we sort of knew from the get go uh, when he was diagnosed, he was told you have stage four cancer. Nobody saw it coming. And he and I got a lot closer and we talked a lot about like death. He's like, hey, man, I know you're into some really weird stuff. And I said, yeah, that's true. And I, he's like, I'm going through something really weird. And I said, that's true, too. I mean, most of us don't get to see our death coming two years out. Right. Um, that's that's horrible. Um, so we talked a lot and we got really close. And he passed away. He was 46. And at the time, um, you know, I was a few years younger. And it was just one of these things where um, a friend of mine from the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society uh, said, hey, we got this fundraiser going on. And I'd done things for them in the past. And, and I was like, Amy, I'm so busy. But, you know, of course, if I'll help if I can. It's like, we're going to climb Mount Kilimanjaro to raise money to fight cancer. And I just, I, I just froze. I went, Kilimanjaro? Like my brother-in-law had just died like six months earlier and there was a chance to do this big thing, cross it off my bucket list, raise money for cancer. And I just looked at her and I was like, yeah, I'm in. And, That's and so we cool. just trained and I became so singularly focused, like on my fitness and on everything. And it was such a transformative experience. It's 19,341 feet tall, the tallest peak in Africa. Uh, it's, it sits just below the equator on the Tanzania and Kenya border. And I got to go there at six days to get to the top, two days to get back down. And just the whole experience was so deeply physical and spiritual, like getting unplugged from the world. No, mm -hmm. no internet, no cell phones, no email. And then uh, getting to the top, hardly able to breathe because there's so little air up there and seeing this sunrise and just sort of connecting with something so big. And like, and, and truly felt like Chris, my brother-in-law was right there with me. Hmm. when this happened. And I will never forget it. It was just this profound uh, changing experience that sent me back a, a slightly different person. And that's, yeah. Amazing. One of the things you said in the, uh, was so interesting to me. I love this uh, quote. See, I think I wrote, I have a bunch of notes on this too, but um, there's something about uh, like, you learn that uh, there's no point in carrying anything that isn't necessary. And that like, cause like you learn that when, with the hike, you're not going to take. So it's like, you kind of have to do that emotionally, kind of a metaphor for life, I guess. I thought that was kind of cool. Absolutely. You know, when you're at some point, I realized in my backpack and I'd trained and I, you know, I'd had a lot of recommendations on what to bring. You realize like, okay, there's some food in there. There's some water. There's like my rain shell. There's another layer of clothes, pictures of my family. Like, you know, I have what I need. It's all there mm -hmm. in my back, you know? And, and then you get to your house and you look around and you're like, I don't really need that. I don't really need that. You know, like I got this shelf over there. I don't really need the shelf, right? You know, I need food and warmth and clothing and shelter. And uh, it was so amazing just to kind of get stripped down to this like simple life of just walking, surviving uh, and climbing for the sake of doing it. And um, it was just, it was, it was amazing. And, and so transformative. Uh, raised over $17,000 for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society in the process. People were so generous. Um, and and that's that's been a, a cause that I've, I've helped with for years. And so, you know, grateful to what they do. And by the way, if anyone else out there, if that calls to you, um, their team and training program, they do not just Kilimanjaro, but they've, they've got like marathons that they, they sponsor where you raise money for them and they help you with coaching and things like that. Wow. And, uh, it's just, it's a great organization if you, if you okay. want to check it out. I'll team put that. Yeah. Org. I'll put that yeah. in the notes. Uh, yeah. Team and training, or is it, would it be the LLS.org? 
LLS.org is the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. Okay. Team and Training is like this subsidiary of LLS oh, okay. that uh, is does does the adventures oh, okay. that people do to, to raise money for them. So, so it's, it's the on same, that website, same website. If people want to, they could either just donate or they could try to do this other stuff. Absolutely. Okay. I mean, you know, if, if like uh, the idea of doing a marathon calls to you, the, what a great, doing it for, and I'll say this too, doing something that big for a cause helped a lot. Like if I just went there mm-hmm. with my own money, that's one thing. Mm-hmm. But like knowing that literally like over 300 people donated because they believed in me doing this, like that's 300 people that pushed me up that mountain. Mm-hmm. I mean, I truly mean it. Like I, I printed out the list of everyone who donated from like $5 to 500. And, and I would look at that list in my tent at night and just mm. be like, I don't want to let you down. I don't want to let you down. I don't want to mm. let you down. You know, I don't want to come home and say, I didn't make it. And, yeah. Uh, it was so motivating. That's really cool. Yeah. It was scary. That one part, like you slipped or whatever. And I was like, Oh, that's so creepy to think if you slip and fall, like, I mean, but you, luckily you weren't alone. So they, they would have brought up a stretcher or something, but yeah, right, good right. thing you kept going. So very cool. And then um, people can go, should they go on your website? Is that the best way to find you or social yeah, media? Or? Okay. Sure. Yeah. I'm on social media, you know, um, exploring legends on um, Instagram and Facebook. And then my website's my name, Jeff Belanger. Okay. Yeah. And I have some more books to read of yours apparently. And uh, uh, I try to watch some of more of those ghost hunters and the, the, all the different things that you're in the new England legends, all sorts of stuff. So People can go down the rabbit hole. It was a lot of fun for me anyway. And you'll have to come back. Yeah, man. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks so much, Jeff. I appreciate it. I'll let you get going then. All right. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Bye-bye. Well, there you go. Uh, Here are the stories from one of the experts in the field. Thank you to Jeff Belanger. Uh, Check out his books. I read two of them. Uh, One is The Most Haunted Places. Here it is right here. And the other one is The Call of Kilimanjaro right here. Uh, So you can read all about his hike. And uh, there, there's a bunch more books that he's written. And, of course, he has a bunch of TV shows that he's appeared on. And like I said, you can go down the rabbit hole, and uh, it's pretty fun. So uh, if you want to go even deeper into a more complex way to look at this stuff and the science behind death and afterlife, check out the interview I did with my dad, Roger Shute, and his book, Ultimate Reality. Here it is here. Uh, I think that's taken things to the next level. Uh, and as always... Make sure to hit that like button on the video if you're watching on YouTube and subscribe button. That'll help me out a lot. And of course, your comments, likes, and shares on social media, that helps me out a a lot as well. Uh, My big goal right now is to hit 1,000 subscribers on YouTube. I want to try to do that before the end of the year. So if you know anyone who likes podcasts or YouTube, let them know about my channel so I can pump up those numbers. Thank you all so much for your support. Have a great rest of your day and remember to shoot for the moon.